given that you obviously tried so hard to get here, I'm going to assume you know something about Sonny, but I suspect you don't know too much about him. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Sonny years ago um, when he was doing, was, it, was My Faith and Frankie your first American assignment? Yes, it would be the first um, with DC Vertigo. Oh uh, well, I, I did one pa one pager with Marvel Comics, uh, just one illustration of Iron Man. Okay. But that that was it until I did uh, my fifth and Frankie. Yeah. So, the business has changed enormously in the time I've been in it. I mean, we had the the only international artists we had in comics mm -hmm. when I came into the field was one Spanish studio that was working for Warren and a Philippine studio that do, was doing a lot of work for DC. And in those days, the system was basically, you found some foreign country where the people were willing to work really cheap, and you paid them a fraction of the American rates, but the artists thought they were screwing the Americans enormously because it was so much more they could earn in their own country, and kind of, in a very entirely sick way, worked in that fashion. The world's gotten a lot smaller, but I don't think we've ever quite seen anything like what's happened with you. The art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai is a un kind of a unique event in that you published in a very unusual fashion in Singapore. I'd like mm. you to tell that story. And then it comes over here to America, and it's really been treated as, in many ways as though it was an American publication here. Um, and certainly the Eisner Awards that you copped last night. I'm pretty sure we've never had an Eisner Award winner for something like Best Writer Artist, whose work was f primarily published somewhere else and then mm -hmm. brought over here. Um, you know, Mobius and other wonderful talents like that never scored that award. So congratulations on breaking every possible precedent. Thank you. Let's tell the gang a little bit about your arc because it's an unusual one. I'd love you to share with them the story of your education, um, your teacher who maybe connected you to the world mm -hmm. of comics first in the process. How the hell do you go through this and get here? It's weird. <laughs> well, I mean, I've, my first paid comic was with a Singapore, Singapore newspaper called uh, the, the New Paper. It's a daily tabloid. Um, you know, I, I, I've liked comics for a long time, but I was back on holiday from school. Uh, I was studying philosophy at, at Cambridge at the time, and I was on holiday in Singapore, and, and I just decided to do my own comic strip. So I drew a comic strip, uh, maybe 12 samples of it, and I sent it into the, to the paper, and they, at the time, were looking for lo local creators, so they decided to publish it as a daily comic strip for about a year. Um, and I think that, that experience, just making comics and getting paid for it, even though it wasn't a lot of money at the time, and having people read those comics, um, it just felt so, so engaging for me that I was pretty sure at that point that I wanted to do something that was at least art-related. Uh, and if I, took, if I could do comics, that would be amazing. Well, what was the other path? I mean, Cambridge, what do you do with a Cambridge philosophy degree? <laughs> do you go off and think brilliant thoughts about how to make the world a better place? Well, we could use some, <laughs> but. In the, in the prospectus, the college prospectus, they, they reassured us that you could get, do philosophy and get a job in banking, so. <laughs> uh, that would be when you major in philosophy subhead greed? No, not really. It was just the idea that you, if you could think analytically, if you could um, write essays, if you could do research, that that could be a skill that could translate into other areas. Britain must be a very different place <laughs> than America. Um, but that's cool. Mm. Um, but you weren't British. So no. how the hell do you get to Cambridge University? Well, I mean, Singapore was a former British colony, so we still have a lot of ties in our uh, system to, to, the, to, the, to the UK. Um, we Had your, any of your family gone to school over there before? Yeah, my, my sister went to Cambridge as well, but wow. she, she was doing economics. Um, I chose a kind of a little less uh, normal practical. path. Yeah, yeah, less less practical path. Yeah. Okay, so you're so you've gone to Cambridge for philosophy. That gives you a wide view of the world, certainly, and we, ha it, in my generation of American comics, we had 
very few well-educated artists. Hmm. Um, there were only two or three of the guys who came through who had college educations at America's top colleges. And I'm, I don't think there was anyone who had gone to school with the kind of quality reputation that Cambridge has. Um, I think that was getting better by, the, by your generational cohort. You're, mm -hmm. I guess, about 15, 20 years younger than I am. Mm -hmm. You're in your early 40s now? Early 40s, that's right. Um, so w we started to have a, cu a couple, of, couple of guys who got real educations, but it was still pretty rare. Most mm -hmm. of the artists were kids who had been drawing on their notebooks all the time, and as fast as they could get out of school, they got out of school and came up to Marvel or DC with their pages and said, you know, Please, sir, may I draw comics for the rest of my life? Um, so you've, but you've gotten this good education and you've gotten a taste of art from this newspaper opportunity. But you're in Singapore. Um, there's mm -hmm. no comics business in Singapore, right? Very little of it, yeah. What was there? So this, we're talking 25 years ago, 23 mm -hmm. years ago. What was the world of comics in Singapore 23 years ago? It's, you know, it's not that different from what it is now, I think. There, there still are no dedicated publishers of comics. Um, there's still no system that you can go to learn from. Like, I think the difference between Singapore and, let's say, the US, Japan, or France is that you have a lot of publishers in, in those countries, a lot of uh, infrastructure that's there. That if mm -hmm. you want to be a comic artist, you can sort of learn the ropes from mentors or people who have done it and figure out how to become an professional artist. But uh, in Singapore at the time especially, I think, um, in fact, we, we still say that we have to reinvent the wheel every time we want to make comics in Singapore. Because mm -hmm. we're trying to find out that, that path that hasn't been created yet. Well, but even, even more so, that's before you had the Singapore toy game and comics mm -hmm. show. Did you have a comic shop in Singapore or two that early? Yeah, but by the 80s, I think it, it, there were quite a few shops in like comic shops in Singapore. Okay, so you have, you have at least some kind of support network going around. You're not, the, you're not perceived to be the only person crazy enough to be interested in American comics. No, no. Comics. In, in, in fact, a group of fans actually started the first Singapore Comic Con in the 80s, and they actually invited uh, Todd McFarlane, I believe, and Brian Bolland, just before they oh. became really famous. They were, they were still on the cusp of being, being famous, and, That's and, cool. and they all, went all the way to Singapore to have that. Huh. Two conventions in the 80s, I think. It's an inter interesting mix of choices, too. Mm. You know, Brian, Brian from England and Todd, mm. Todd's a Canadian, but uh, he was, I think, living in the U.S. already at that point. Or maybe mm. he was still Canadian. Maybe, maybe this was a British Empire comic kind of convention. It just I, I don't know, because I, I, I actually didn't attend those conventions. It's something that I found out about later. Yeah. So, yeah. So you've had this taste with the one newspaper. Mm. You're starting to want to draw seriously. You're in Singapore. Nobody from DC or Marvel or any American publisher can find Singapore on the map. Uh, we're Americans. We mm -hmm. don't pay attention to any country that can't blow us up um, or, or, or didn't previously. I, I think that's a fair way of judging the American perspective on things. Um, you know, nor we can find North Korea on the map now because they're threatening to kill us. But you know, the, don't 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 ask us to find. Oh, I don't I don't know Albania. Albania. Uh, certainly. Uh, not many people can find Albania anyway. Um, so you're interested in this world away. Have you seen a lot of American comics at that point? Or British? You've seen British comics, because as a former colony, mm. I'm sure they're, are they getting 2000 AD? Have you seen that? Yeah, that was one of my primary influences, I think. When I was maybe 14 or 15, I discovered uh, 2080 magazine, you know, and Alan Moore was doing comics. Well, he, he was kind of really left, but they would release this monthly comics that were collected all the old stories, mm -hmm. and you would see Alan Moore, uh, Simon Beasley was just starting out there, I think, at the time. You know, so there were all these incredible British artists and writers doing 2080, and, you know, that really kind of blew my mind that you could get a magazine that was maybe 20 pages long and there were five stories in there and there would be five different artists and writers with all different styles just in that slim magazine. And, and that kind of changed, changed the way I saw comics a little bit, I think, because I've been used to seeing comics that were all in one style. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, and also it was black and white, so the art mm. was very accessible to you mm. as an artist, I guess, right? You were able mm. to look at it and really really assess the material in a different kind of way. Mm. I mean, the American comics at the time are in color, but mostly they're in pretty crappy color um, that probably did more to hide the art than enhance it. 
um, constructively hide it sometimes, but that's a whole other question. Um, so you're sitting there and you're seeing 2000 AD and you've had a taste of doing this and we're way before the internet. We're way before, you're still in international reply coupons that you used to buy to send letters from country to country if you wanted to, to get mail back, a phone call from. Well, not, not quite, because by the time it was already the 90s, so we already had email and we had, you know. You had email that early? Yeah, 1990, I was in Cambridge in 93, 94. Okay. Right? So by the time I was doing comics, it was really like 95, 96. Okay, so right. yeah. a little bit of modern technology is creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first comic I did, I had to fax back things when it was really urgent. So, mm -hmm. the, But by a few years later, we had email. Okay. And so it was a little bit. So who yeah. do you email? How do you, how do you connect with the larger world of comics from Singapore? Um, I, I don't think I actually initially did. I mean, one of the uh, problems was trying to figure out how to become a comic artist, like how, how to do it. And uh, I remember I, I, I printed out this, this flyer asking people to, to, who wanted to make comics to, if they wanted to be part of an anthology. Hmm. And I, would put, I, I pinned that poster up in all the bookstores in Singapore. Huh. And I actually got quite a few responses. People write in and say they want to do comics, but uh, I had no idea how to get the money to do this, you know, <laughs> and so I, I kind of talked to my sister and said, you know, would anyone be interested in publishing comics? Because she, she, was, she was an economist in banking, I asked her if she knew friends who would be interested to in invest, and the answer was basically no, you know, no one wanted to do <laughs> comics. Uh, but she did tell me to try coming to the U.S. for right. art school instead, and that's what I ended up doing. I came to RISD through Art School of Design to to learn art, because I've been self-taught up to that point. Um, so I wanted to learn to paint, to draw better, to learn more about comics. You didn't take any art courses at Cambridge? No, no. Just, yeah. just, the, yeah. just the serious stuff. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating. Mm. So you come over to RISD. I mean, first of all, going to Cambridge took enormous courage. You were going thousands of miles away. But at least you were staying within the empire. Um, and you were going, going to a school with an amazing international reputation. You know, I can imagine you turn it, turning to your father. Your, sis, your sister had already been there. Okay, that she came back alive. She's mm -hmm. gotten a job out of it. That's a plausible case. Now you turn around to your parents and say, uh, I want to go to America and mm -hmm. this thing called RISD, it's in Rhode Island. I suspect people have no more idea what the hell Rhode Island is in mm -hmm. Singapore than people in Rhode Island have of what Singapore is. How did you sell that idea? You know, looking back, it seems ridiculous, but <laughs> at, at the time, my parents were really supportive of, of what I wanted to do, I think. Uh, yeah. Have they given up on being supportive now? They seem to be pretty happy the other night at the awards show. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's taken a while. Bef you know, when I first started out doing comics, they would always ask me what my next project was, whether I was making enough money, you know, like all parents would worry about right. their kids. But um, maybe in, in the last two or three years, I think, my career has reached a point where it's starting to seem as if I'm getting somewhere. <laughs> so they're, they're a little bit more relaxed about it now, but uh, it's, it's taken a long time to get there. It's a, it's a good thing if they're getting relaxed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that may just be their own aging. You get a little calmer. Could be. <laughs> Could be. Um, maybe the Eisners will help. Maybe, maybe they'll no, stop asking, yeah. <laughs> asking now. So you talk them into you're going to RISD. How did you pick RISD? Um, so my sister also went to the U.S. for school. She went to Harvard for Asian studies. Uh, okay. And she brought back a bunch of um, art school brochures. Huh. And, and I applied for, uh, I remember rightly, uh, SVA, Parsons, RISD, and almost CalArts. But CalArts had a really long form to fill, and I just, <laughs> I, I just gave it halfway. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fill the whole form, so I just stopped. And I think I got into the SVA, but... Um, as a kid, I, I never liked cities, I never liked crowds, so I thought New York would, would kind of be a hard place to live in. Could, could be wrong, you know, I, I don't you know. You never liked cities and you were living in Singapore? Well, not out of choice. I mean, Singapore is just what it is, a city-state, but yeah. uh, I wouldn't like going to the like, is, shopping. Is, is there any suburban corner of Singapore? I didn't get to explore that much the one time I was there. Uh, there are, I mean, and, and that's, what I that's where I would kind of like to go to, but in the main shopping areas where it's very crowded, I always feel like uh, claustrophobic, I think. Ah, yeah. okay. Well. So, so New York seemed like it would just be a, 
even worse version of that. Yeah. At, at a time, at a time. Without uh, the air conditioning. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, so I, I chose Rhode Island just mainly because it felt like it'd be a smaller place that I could adapt to more easily, I think. Were you fooled by the, the name Rhode Island into thinking it was an island like Singapore? No, no. Ah. No, just, but, just you know, checking. but when I did get there, I, I remember I, I, I got to Rhode Island and I went to walk around downtown and Taylor Street and I got a little bit depressed because it was a little bit too... Uh, unurban, I think, mm. at the time. I, I was, yeah, it was a bit of a cultural shock for me too. Is it to in Providence? I Providence, yeah, yeah, Rhode Island, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Providence is okay, but there's not a lot happening there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. But it's a, it's a wonderful school. I mean, I do think mm. it was a, a much better choice for you than SVA. Mm. Uh, well, wh why do you say that? Like, well, SVA had a, right, really a golden decade when Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, and Art Spiegelman were teaching there. Um, th that's from about 1970 to the, maybe the early 1980s. Mm. But by the time you were going there, it was not an all-star teaching environment. Okay. And SVA is an unusual school in America because it's a school that is run as a business. It's mm. a for-profit institution, which very few colleges are in the US. And that may be, be a factor of why, why it is what it is too. Mm. Uh, RISD, Hasn't produced a lot of great comic book people, but um, Walt Simonson went through there, you know, well before you. Obviously, he's 20 years older, mm. um, but it's regarded as just a much higher level art school on mm. fine art and the high theory of art. So mm. I think I suspect you got a you got a better education there. Well, and I did get to meet uh, David Mosakelli, which is yeah. Yeah. So. Tell us about that, because I think that's that's a real turning point in your professional career. Yeah, because I mean, up, up to that point, I never met anyone who was in the comic industry and couldn't, couldn't figure out how to become a comic artist. But uh, David was at a time teaching at RISD, and you know he had done Batman Year One, Daredevil, and then moved on to doing Rubber Blanket. So he kind of knew the whole industry inside out, both the mainstream comic stuff and the uh, alternative comics press stuff. Um, so I, I took his class, I think, like three times during my, my, my time at, at RISD. Because right. uh, you, you're only supposed to take it once, because you can only take, it's elective, you, you can only take once, but... Did you deliberately fail? No, no, no. So David knew that a lot of us would come back, so he would keep changing his course number code, right? Ah. So you could take it again and again and again. Cool. Uh, yeah. I did that with Frank McCourt in high school. Okay. And I kept, <laughs> kept taking his class, so I understand exactly what mm, you're talking about. Mm. And David was, I, I would suspect, a really great teacher. Yeah, because he, he would, you know, I think that's kind of Risty's reputation, that you get to explore uh, your own style and your own approach to, to art and storytelling. Mm. So his, his course was never about trying to get us to draw or tell stories in a certain way. It's more about introducing to us, us to a really wide range of comics and trying to figure out, like, let, let us figure out ourselves what, what we want to do with our own comics and storytelling. Okay. So you're working on your stuff, you're build, building your thing, you've made this bridge to the American comics market in David in that he knows how mm. the system works. I know you did a variety of self-published, semi-self-published projects in mm. Singapore, but I can't really date whether that's before or after My Faith in Frankie, which, which happened first. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit simultaneous because I, I for, for class in RISD, I had done a comic called Melanchy Robot. I remember that. Which was a uh, stro story about two street urchins living in a sort of future dystopia, based in, most, mostly based in Japan. Mm -hmm. And I'd used that as a portfolio piece to get work from DC Vertigo, uh -huh. right? But I also applied for a Zarek grant through it and got the grant to publish that comic. Oh, wow. So it's kind of simultaneous at the same time. So I was doing Cliff and Frankie, I came out of Singapore, and at the same time published Men Hero Report. Cool. The Zero Grants were Ke Kevin Eastman or Peter Laird? Pe Peter, Peter Laird, Laird, I believe. Peter yeah. Laird, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So just for any of you who don't know, Peter Laird, who was one of the co-creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, had made a fair amount of money uh, from it and wanted to get back to the profession. And for many years, he doesn't do it anymore, but for many years he was giving these, you know, not enormous grants, but grants that were very significant for young cartoonists. And did that last a year, or was just one flat amount? Uh, it's a flat amount to publish the, your comic. Yeah, yeah, to bring something out and try mm -hmm. try your own thing. 
and that was a, that was a great opportunity. Um, yeah, you got to write Peter a note, uh, <laughs> obviously now, and go full circle. Mm -hmm. So you, you hook up with Vertigo, and Shelley's told the story of getting a note from David saying, "Take a look at this guy's stuff." Mm -hmm. uh, I think did, I think Karen got it first, and then passed it on to Shelley Bond, who's editing there. My faith and Frankie, for any of you who have not searched out of Sonny's stuff, is this just absolutely charming uh, little mini-series about a girl with her sort of personal god, guardian angel, and uh, how their, their life transpires together. Mm -hmm. You originally wanted to do all the art on it. Uh, it was a Mike Carey script mm -hmm. that had already been developed at that point. Mike was still fairly early in his career. He wasn't the superstar that he, he became later, but he was established already mm -hmm. at that point. Um, did they, and they didn't let you do, they didn't let you do all the art? Well, I, I want to go, I think, go back a bit, a little, a little bit, because Shelley tells the story now that she sort of put the portfolio and immediately put me on a project. But I think what really happened was that she saw the portfolio and thought I might do something interesting. So she sent me a script for a project that, that hadn't been published yet. It was called Fables. Um, you know, and, and I had to do like a two-page uh, sample for it. So mm. I did it and I sent it in, and it you know really wasn't really good. You know, it was. <laughs> uh, so they hired I think someone else instead to do it. You know, and it was after a few months later. I think they they, they saw my friend and Frankie. It was a four-issue miniseries that they thought. You uh, can't screw that you up. You can't screw up too badly, right? So they asked me to do both the pencil and inks for that that story. Um, but when I turned in the first issue, uh, I got a call from Shelley saying you know, maybe we need someone else to ink it for you. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, that's how it happened, in, at least in my memory. Yeah. Okay, and that's Mark, Mark Hempel? Mark Hempel. Yeah. Mark Hempel goes over it, mm -hmm. and goes over your line work, and it is very charming, I suggest mm -hmm. you check it out. And of course, and in the alternate reality, his wonderful work on that would have immediately led to a five-year exclusive contract with DC, drawing mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff, but it didn't quite work out that way. So. Clearly, and this is DC on my watch, so mm -hmm. I have to take some of the responsibility. So we were clearly incredibly stupid for n not signing you up. What did you go and do after that? Well, there's actually a period of a few months after my friend Frankie that I was, I couldn't get any work, I think. I, oh, I didn't get any work, not that I. And I was wondering whether I had to find another job, another career for a while, but I, I kind of hung in there and eventually, I, I believe I got some work from SLG to do Wonderland, I think. Hmm. Uh, Dan Vado. Mm -hmm. um, I can't quite remember now. I, I think I might have turned down Top Shelves, The Surrogates, to, to do that, <laughs> which turned out to okay. be a, you know, kind of a mistake because it became a movie with Bruce Willis in it. But uh, yeah, my, my next big project was probably Wonderland with SLG and Disney. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you're managing to, to make a living. Barely, barely, yeah. The American dollar doesn't have any extra swing in Singapore, so it's not like it. Oh, it does. It does. It's, uh, it like goes a little further, maybe. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, so that's helping even if there's if there's gaps mm -hmm. in it. Um, it's also harder to look for the work from the, over there. I mean, the internet helps, but it's not the same as staring your editor in the face and mm -hmm. saying, "Please, sir or ma'am, I need pages now." <laughs> but um, but that's why I would come to San Diego because that the only way that I could kind of meet editors and publishers here in in, in the U.S. Back then. It's perseverance is a major part of breaking into the mm -hmm. field and establishing a solid career. So you go from that to again doing more self publishing. You keep playing with Malinky Robot mm -hmm. and the Secret Robot Factory and ideas of your own. You do some of that through image at one point? Uh, that's fairly late on, I think. That's after I, I, I had done. The so a few stories uh, with, I think, well, one of the things that helped me establish my, my sort of career here was the flight anthology that was edited by Kazu Kabushi. Okay. Yeah, so th that was, I mean, it turned out to be one of the most popular anthologies uh, of the last 10 years, I think. So, mm. and I think he, he had seen that Malinky Robot uh, self-published one that I had done. So he, he emailed me and asked me to do a story for him. Uh, I think that, that maybe raised my profile a little bit in, okay. in, in the US. Um, but I, I think also Shelley remembered me from mm -hmm. Frankie, and she, uh, so when, when she started DC Minx, that short-lived uh, attempt to publish 
DC Comics for young female readers, right? A little too early. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, maybe a little too hip overall. Yeah. But, uh, mm. but our hearts were in the right place. Mm -hmm. Shelley certainly was incredibly passionate about it. Uh, so, so she asked me, um, Mike, Mike and Mark Hempel to do another story mm. uh, for, for that. Um, and, and I think I, I kind of got pigeonholed a little bit at, at a point in time, because I'd done uh, Magic with Frankie, Regifters, Wonderland, and they all featured female protagonists, right, female characters as, as leads. Mm. So I think, well, my sense is that, that uh, editors here thought I, that's, what, that's what I was. You draw pretty girls. Not pretty, pretty girls, but at least my style was suitable for that. So I ended up doing uh, Jane Austen adaptations for Marvel after that as well. You know. Did you want to do straight superheroes then at that point? Was it, were you sitting there saying, you know, mm. I, what I want to do is Batman and they're making me draw, draw teenage girls? Not, not quite. I mean, doing superheroes was something that felt like you'd be a feather in your cap that you, you had done Batman or Superman or some superhero, but uh, I don't think I actually read a, enough superhero comics to be really into it at the time. So okay. I was kind of just hoping to do... Um, I, I think my, my heroes at the time were more people like Chester Brown, uh, Chris Warren, and Daniel Close. Oh, cool. Right? So it's the, the more indie alternative stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I always wanted to do something that I could write and draw that was in that vein, I think. Okay. So I'm going to go very fast through <laughs> Shadow Heroes since mm. Gene didn't show up. Hell with him. Gene well, um, and Yang. Yeah. So. <laughs> you had the opportunity to work with Gene. Was, it, was that his first? big creator control project after American Born Chinese? I don't remember him doing anything in between. No, I, hmm. Maybe. Oh, no, I think he was doing boxes and scenes at the same time. Ah, that's right. Which that's is why right. he, he wanted that. someone else to draw the art for Shadow Hero. Okay. Yeah. Um, so he did Shadow Hero, another one, charming, charming thing, and that's a step sideways into the superhero universe, but mm. very much sideways. It's an un unusual project. Um, and somewhere around there, you have the courage to start Charlie Chan. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think I've, I kind of felt I was stuck in a, in a rut. No, not a rut, but at least I, my career had kind of plateaued a little bit because I've been doing a lot of comics for other writers. And mm -hmm. like I said, I, I, I wanted to be more like Daniel Clowers or Chris Ware. So I wanted to do comics that I could write and draw. And Charlie Chan, for me, was in a way a... I would say maybe one of the last shots I had at it, you know, because I, I thought, you know, if this, does, this doesn't work out, this idea or this book doesn't work out, I might have to reconsider my options a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So how do you, it's a project of incredible courage. Mm. I mean, I don't, I don't easily think of more than a handful of American projects that have that kind, that kind of, I'm leaping off a cliff quality. I think of building stories mm. um, in a very different way, but with the same kind of level of impossibility. The, there's an intellectual level of courage in saying, I'm gonna do, do a double task. I'm going to tell a longitudinal story of a man's life across a whole life as a cartoonist, and I'm gonna explore, I don't know how many different styles, we'll come back to that, um, and I'm going to take the whole modern history of my country, which is complicated mm -hmm. and intensely emotionally political already by those years in Singapore, and I'm going to sandwich these two things together and use parallel storytelling and fit all this into one book. Didn't anybody tell you you were jumping off a building without a parachute? Not quite, because I couldn't quite explain it to anyone. Like, <laughs> like, like, I That's remember. That's not a good thing when you're trying to sell a project. I know, Sonny. I know. So I, I, I would, because, you know, the, the book is about Singapore history told through a fictional comic history, and initially I had thought that it would be involve like a whole generation of comic artists, like ten different people involved in, in this in this narrative. Mm -hmm. So I thought the only way I could pull it off was to get other people to draw with me on oh, this wow. book. So I, I, I kind of talked to all my friends who were in comics and asked them if they were interested in it. And I had to explain it to them, and I could never explain it properly. So they would kind of look at me kind of strangely and not quite get it. And run in terror. And say, no, not run in terror, just kind of like, why do you do this instead? Or they, they would have their own <laughs> ideas about what it, what it could be or what it should be. Okay. Right, so... Uh, 
And so I think I essentially shelved the idea for a few years because I couldn't quite figure out who would publish a book like that. Um, there was no one in Singapore who, at the time I thought, could do it, and there's no one I could find in the U.S. who would be interested in it. Mm -hmm. um, how, much, how much had you done to that point in terms of any actual pages or chapters well, when you were trying to shop it? Or was mm, you were just pitching the idea? It was just in my head, and I, I couldn't figure out where to go to, right? Okay. Because uh, I couldn't think of any publisher at the time who would be interested in it. So you've got this unusual, we'll be kind, idea, possibly unsaleable. <laughs> um, you're in a country with no comics publishing industry. Um, you have not suddenly inherited a million dollars mm -hmm. that you want to splurge on being a comic book artist. I, I, if you did, I, mi I missed that part of the story. Okay. Um, and you try to figure out how to do it, and you do it you get a grant from the government to insult them? It's, it's kind of complicated because um, the, the initial grant we had was from one organization called the Media Development Author Authority. Okay. And they, they, they had given this publisher in Singapore a $150,000 grant to do five books, right? So 30, 30K per book. Mm -hmm. uh, and the publisher had approached a few of his local creators to ask if he were interested. And, you know, 30K was quite a lot of money for a local comic publisher to, to offer. So I think we kind of jumped on the chance. And I thought this would be the perfect chance to do this book that I've been thinking about because it, it, they wanted something local and there was some money involved in it. Uh, so I started doing the book uh, in 2012. But the problem was that they wanted the book to be done within a year. Uh, and it, the book initially I thought could be 120 pages long. It could be involve essays and pictures as opposed to comics and more comics. Okay. So I thought it, could, it might be feasible in, in 12 months. But once I started doing it, I realized that it had to be a, a lot longer and that I had to kind of replace the essays with actual comics to make it readable. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that, that funding body, the MDA, couldn't understand that. They kept telling us, why can't you finish in a year? Like, why, why are you like slacking off? You know? <laughs> So they, they redrew the grant for, for the book. Wow. Um, they even threatened to, to redraw the grant for all the books that had already been done, because there were five books involved, right? Wow. So, but the publisher managed to pers persuade them to let me keep 120K and just take away that, that 30K. And that's when they applied for the, another grant from the National Arts Council. Um, which, and that is a grant that was eventually withdrawn. Was pulled back yeah, yeah. when they actually read it and said, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, this wasn't what we had in mind. Uh, it's, it's complicated, I think, the whole story. <laughs> well, I'm not going to try to ask you to explain Singapore's complicated mm -hmm. politics here. Uh, what I would like you to explain, though, before we run out of time on the project, um, is which artist style you had Charlie work in at different times. Because I know as I looked through, I mm -hmm. saw it and I said, this one's Eisner, this one feels Barks, this mm -hmm. one feels Walt Kelly. Who am I missing or forgetting? Um, Frank Miller, okay. near, near the end, a bit of a Dark Knight Returns in there. Um, Tezuka at the beginning. Um, Harvey Kurtzman was a big influence. Uh, his Two-Fisted Tales and all those stories were a part of it. Uh, somewhere in the middle, I tried to mix Kurtzman, Kirby, and Tatsumi into a new, the, new the, mix. Uh, yeah, cool. in there. There's some her in as well, Tintin, mm -hmm. or Tantan, as basically always call, calls it <laughs> Tantan, because it's Belgian. Uh, that might be it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to jump just very fast to Dr. Fate and say that um, I had the pleasure of running into Sunny in Singapore when I went mm -hmm. there to attend one of their conventions as a guest, and that reminded me of him and when I had the opportunity to suggest an artist for Dr. Fate, I rem remembered his work and thought, you know, he'd be a wonderfully fresh approach. We hadn't, I didn't really know Sonny well. We'd shaken mm -hmm. hands a couple of times, but I knew his work a bit. And he, the shadow hero stuff had sort of shown that he understood the superhero language. It was an extraordinary experience working with him, with the, the singular exception of the one moment when he kind of forgot that we drive on the correct side of the road here in America, not the lunatic British side of the road. If you look very carefully in the very first Dr. Fate story. Really? This is the, 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 that the, that'll be the second time I, I did that, because I did the same with Regiftus, and Shelley said we have to flip that panel. 
And I was very angry because once you flip the panel, the whole composition of the page exactly. gets, gets yeah, screwed we up. Didn't, we, didn't, we didn't fix it for that okay. reason. <laughs> okay. But uh, if you look carefully, you can spot where the Belt Parkway is driving on the left side of the road in Brooklyn, which is not a good idea. But I've, you know, I've worked with an, an incredible range of artists in my career. Um, I don't think I've ever worked with a smarter one. Um, the, the back and forth dialogue on how to do things better at different times was just wonderful fun. Um, and if, if you, this is the commercial announcement for the, for it, you must buy, if you have not already, The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai as a, if you've attended this panel, but you should also buy at least the first volume of Dr. Faith, The Blood Price, because there's some wonderful work by Sonny, and some amazing, I call them paintings. I don't know if you consider them paintings, the cover pieces that mm -hmm. you did for Dr. Faith. What technique did you use for that? They, you did those all on computer, right? Yeah, they're digital. Yeah. Um, so what program do you use when you're doing it digitally? Is it Photoshop to start with? You work just with just, just Photoshop. Yeah. It's, mm -hmm. Check it out. It's some really awesome stuff. 